Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Danny Hoffman, and I am the interim director of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies here at the University of Washington. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this event, the Afghan diaspora, the Taliban, and the rule of law. Now, although we are meeting virtually, I'd like to, to begin the way that we begin all of our public programming uh, by acknowledging that the Jackson School recognizes that we are on Coast Salish territory, the traditional homelands of the Duwamish, the Suquamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and other indigenous peoples. The Jackson School understands that the international community includes sovereign American Indian tribes, First Nations, and indigenous peoples across the world. Now, I know that many of you will be familiar with the Jackson School and with our commitment to public scholarship and to public engagement. At the Jackson School, we identify strongly with the idea that one understands world affairs primarily through context. To make sense of things happening every day around the globe, one must have a grounding in diverse languages, histories, cultures, political and economic systems. So I'm thrilled today to be able to welcome three visiting scholars and a University of Washington faculty moderator who, will be, who are willing and able to share exactly that kind of expertise. And of course, welcome to all of you. And I'd like to quickly thank the Mesa Global Academy for initiating this panel and providing their support, the Jackson School Communications Team, the South Asia, Middle East, Global Studies and Human Rights Centers here at the University of Washington, and my friend and colleague, Dr. Arzu Asanlu, Director of the Middle East Center, who will introduce and moderate today's panel. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Danny, and thank you for including me in this amazing event. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues in the Jackson School, and I particularly want to name um, Monique Thorman, the Director of Communications in the Jackson School, and Nick Gottschall, who's the Managing Director of the South Asia Center, because without them, we would not have been able to put this event together. Um, so my role as moderator today is to introduce our speakers. I'll introduce each in turn. They will speak for about 15 minutes each. And then at the end, I'll be happy to um, moderate the questions to our speakers as well. So with that, let me introduce our first speaker. Well, our, let me just say our all three speakers. Their first speaker is Professor uh, Sayyid Hassan Ahlor at Marymount University. Our second speaker is going to be Professor Harun Rahimi, who's at the American University of Afghanistan. And our third speaker will be Professor Sharif Hazuri um, at Cornell University. So with that, now I will introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Sayyid Hassan Ahlor. Professor Ahlor received his PhD in philosophy at Alame Tabao Tabao'i University in Tehran. He also co-founded uh, the Qarjistan University in Kabul, Afghanistan, Afghanistan. And he currently teaches religion and philosophy in George Washington University, Marymount, and Coppin State University. Professor Akhlaq works on Islamic governance, dialogue among civilizations, human rights, rule of law, and interreligious studies. His article on nation building and the missed critical element of a unifying ideology in Afghanistan was published last summer in the Journal of South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. His recent book, The Making of Shia Ayatollahs, is forthcoming with Roman and Littlefield, expected just um, next month in May of 2023. And with that, I turn it over to Professor Akhla. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Arizu, for a great introduction. And I really thank everybody who made the effort to, to uh, this event happens. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about my project. Uh, actually, the uh, talk that I'm delivering right now is uh, about Islamic jurisprudence and rule of law in the time of the uh, modern nation state. That's its old time. So uh, as an Afghan scholar, uh, so I, I'm not just an scholar, and I couldn't be an scholar, just merely an scholar, because being an Afghan needs a lot of requirements. Uh, at the same time, a person, even a scholar, has to be activist, has to uh, work in public, uh, and to feel kind of responsibility for the betterment of the situation. 
and all of them played in role uh, uh, that I'm playing in academia and in my project. So I cannot uh, concentrate and focus on one thing. Maybe you heard that a lot of a, uh, a range of the interests that uh, I at the same time I'm working. And the project that right now I'm working on, I would like to share with uh, you and in the time of the Q&A to learn from you. So as I just told you, is about the rule of law in a Muslim country. Uh, I was teaching uh, philosophy and teaching uh, uh, Crito, uh, yeah, very well-known treatise of the Plato, the, actually the history of the Socrates that uh, at the uh, before Socrates uh, get killed so or get poisoned, so he he asked this question that so why he want to stay in the jail? Why he's not ready to get uh, rid of the jail to escape? And uh, Socrates talks about the law and shows a lot of respect to the law and is ready to actually to to be killed, to die for the law, even believes and claim to believe and cre to believe and all people who are there in the conversation that uh, an uh, unjust law uh, condemned him to death, but he is ready to die and he uh, argues for the law. It inspired me why we have no this kind of the respect to the law in Muslim country, particularly Islam is known. Everybody uh, in the West, when they hear the word Islam, the first thing come to their minds is Sharia or Sharia law. So long, long history of the law. And then we don't see you know, much respect to the law uh, with regard to the report, the World Justice Project reports to, about the rule of law index 2000. Uh, 22. So the first Muslim country is United State. Uh, sorry, United Arab uh, uh, Emirate, rank 37. Many Muslim country hold the low rank. For example, Turkey 116, Iran 119, Pakistan 129, Egypt 135 out of 140. So that's a big question, why we have lack of respect to the law and the rule of law is a problematic in Muslim country. That, uh, that is my big concern with this uh, project. Uh, I'm not uh, considering the uh, cultural, uh, social, political, uh, and even economic, this kind of the elements, of course, they play a role in in creating this culture that uh, respect of law is not uh, uh, apparent, but uh, my concentration is on uh, look at the law in Islam and see something, some elements in the Sharia law that actually play like a barriers, like an obstacle to rule of law in current Muslim country. So far, I uh, I got five points that I would like to share. Uh, so and I give some example to clarify them. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind with regard to jurisprudence or fiqh, the technical term for the jurisprudence in Islam, now that plays the uh, uh, backward uh, or plays a uh, a, a, rule, a negative rule with regard to rule of law is that uh, Sharia in Islam uh, in the Quran has a wider meaning, more uh, mostly connected with the God, but throughout uh, Islamic history and particularly in current time, is reduced to the uh, fiqh or jurisprudence. What does it mean? It means that, so we have two terms, one is Sharia, one is Fiqh or jurisprudence. Sharia reminds Muslim of the divine aspect, but Fiqh or jurisprudence remind them of human aspect of that. Uh, 
uh, Muslim are switching between Sharia and jurisprudence. Uh, it's a confusing message. So the law that they see, if they see flaw, if they see problem, they think it's come from the jurisprudence. It's because of the scholars, because of the methodology they are using, because of the all things like that. But uh, when they are uh, encouraged to practice with that, they think if Muslim are practicing law or in accordance with law, they will be rewarded before God. And if they ignore this practice, they will be punished by God. So with regard to practice, they refer to the divine aspect of that. But with regard to the you know, flaws and problem and something that uh, uh, is problematic, so they say, oh, that's a, uh, a scholar, that's a, that's a faqih, that's a jurist, that's a, this kind of people. So... Uh, that's, I think, one point that plays role in uh, in confusing Muslim and uh, they don't know, is it law or it's a ethical guidance to, uh, to, uh, to get inspired with them. If it's a Sharia, it's a guidance. It's not a uh, clear and strict law to follow. But if it's a jurisprudence, it's a, a strict law but there are a lot of flaws and there are a lot of restrictions. So this move between two uh, direction uh, plays a role in uh, in confusion and uh, lack of respect to the law. That's one thing. The second point that comes uh, to my mind is that so Muslim Muslim claim Islamic State is a kind of the a democracy. Uh, but in reality, uh, it's not uh, democracy. It's mostly uh, inclined to a, a theocracy or um, or other form of the dictatorship or something like that. So, in in theory, Muslim claim sovereignty uh, is not for the ruler nor for the clergy. It's uh, the, uh, for the word of God that is embodied in Sharia, is embodied in the law. So the ruler of Islam and the lay people and the clergy, all of them have to show respect to the law uh, and they obey the law. But in reality, the people who introduce law to, uh, to make sure that law is, uh, is respected and it's applied, so they are... Uh, clergy, they are uh, rulers, and they, in some ways, sometimes people get this feeling that it's not uh, nomocracy, it's a theocracy. People on the name of God, they govern government. So that's a, a conflict between theory and the practice uh, play a role. For example, nowadays we hear the word caliph, or particularly in the case of Afghanistan, the leader of Taliban calls himself Amir al -Mu'minin. So like, Amir al muminin is, uh, is a term that reminds of the theocracy, not actually what Sharia claimed, that's a nomocracy or the rule of law, because they are not following the law. They just initiate and uh, they impose law. The third point is uh, the law in the time of the uh, modern nation states. So that actually creates some problem for Sharia or some uh, difficulties for Sharia. Because uh, nation state in modern time, when it came to the Muslim countries, of course, it was concerned with uh, political power, uh, particularly with the, the fight against colonialism, uh, military security, and consider itself responsible to bring public order. But Sharia for Muslim is not for just public order or for political power or military. Mostly traditional goals of the uh, Sharia that the Islamic State uh, consider that is to administrate worldly justice and maintain religious dignity. But for Muslim, 
modern nation state has no that kind of the quality to, to bring justice or to maintain religious dignity. So even these modern nation state connect them, associate them with the Sharia code codification of the Sharia. It's a very common among Muslim and start from uh, Egypt uh, by Abdul Razak Sanhurin, uh, 1971, and the big major with that is the Ottoman Majalla and then Syrian uh, concept of the Ishtahat as a stationary uh, legislation. So they try to connect Sharia with the modern state, but in reality, it didn't work. So that's uh, another obstacle. The fourth obstacle is now, the current talk about the Sharia and by Islamist group or people who are saying that we want to bring Sharia uh, dominant in society. So, and uh, they uh, and they are not successful in uh, introducing Sharia to promote rule of law is they ignoring historical development of the uh, Sharia and jurisprudence. So mostly they jump from the current time to the earlier time of the Prophet or Caliphs, and they say, okay, this is the rule of Islam and we want to apply it. That's a big, big problem because Sharia changed throughout history, tried to adjust with the new demands, with new circumstances, with new things. To give an example, so for example, Hanafi, that's that is a were dominant school in Sunni Islam and in Afghanistan, including. So throughout history, they learned to change the binary of Dar al Kufr and Dar al Islam, the house of Islam and house of Kuf, to the uh, new concept of the uh, three uh, different realms Dar al Islam, Dar al Kufr, and Dar al Sol to have peace with other part of the world. But because new Islamist group. They just jumped to the earlier Islam that divided world into two uh, sections of the Islam and Kuf. So they have problem with the world. And that reflects in, inside of Islam a flaw, a, a difficulty that uh, leads to uh, a lack of the enough respect to law. So I have more examples, maybe in the q and A, I I will share. And the last point, that I would like to share is that so Sharia developed in the way that it's very very involved with uh, with very trivial matters now, that a regular Muslim uh, doesn't see their connection with the objective of the Sharia with the so Sharia has law about very very uh, little things about how to wear my jacket, how to look, how to behave. And then a regular Muslim cannot find their connection with something that uh, is related to objective or maqasat al-sharia. In other words, I think the concept of the comprehensive sharia changed throughout history uh, in a way that uh, replaced uh, the aim of the Quran that was connecting every aspect of life to God through self, uh, through self consciousness to kind of the uh, scholarship that uh, uh, that a mujtahid, a professional, objective, uh, a skillful a scholar connect me with God. And here, my connection with God is lost. And if I have no connection with God, and this law huh, uh, talks on behalf of God, I don't see myself up late to follow that. These are something that I see in the uh, current development of Sharia that shows kind of tension and uh, participate or contribute to the uh, lack of respect to the rule of law in Muslim uh, countries. And because of that, we see they are ranked uh, at the bottom of the list of the uh, uh, countries and people who show respect to the law. So, yeah, thank you for uh, listening, and I uh, look forward to hear your uh, points and your comments and your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fascinating introduction and discussion. 
Um, I did forget to mention, please uh, feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A. And at the end, I'll be happy to read them out loud and we'll have a discussion. <clears throat> now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Harun Rahimi. Um, Professor Rahimi obtained his bachelor's in law from Herat University. And we're very pleased that he received both his LLM in global business law and his PhD from the University of Washington School of Law. Professor Rahimi is an associate professor of law and the interim chair of the law department at the American University of Afghanistan. Professor Rahimi's research focuses on economic laws, institutional reform, Islamic finance, and divergent conceptions of the rule of law in Muslim and modern thought, as well as in religious authority. Professor Rahimi is currently a Global Academy Scholar at the Middle East Studies Association and an Associate Editor at the Manchester Journal of Transnational Islamic Law and Practice. He also has a blog spot. I don't have the address for it, but maybe you can tell us so that people can reach you, uh, reach your blog. I think that would be fascinating. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Osamlu. Appreciate the introduction uh, and welcome up to everyone. Uh, and thank you to my uh, colleague who spoke before me, uh, Hassan Akhlaq. I uh, enjoyed listening to him. The topic of my conversation today is actually connected to what uh, Mr. Akhlaq was talking about. Um, I would like to take this time and interrogate the relationship of Taliban with modernity. Um, it may come across as a strange question to ask whether Taliban are modern or not. But I think uh, on second thought, it may not be as strange. Um, uh, to, for this question to make sense, one have to understand what we mean by modernity. And there are different ways one can think of modernity. If you think of modernity as a temporal period in human history, then Taliban by virtue of having emerged in that temporal period are modern. So there's no kind of conversation to be had there. However, if one associates modernity with a series of ideas, then we can reasonably ask, how do Taliban as a, as a group, as a movement relate to those ideas? I obviously intend the second meaning. I think of modernity as uh, associated with a certain ideas, uh, um, chief among them, the emergence of nation states, nationalism, bureaucracy, the decline in public influence of religion, uh, the assertion of private sphere and individual rights, and the increase in the authority of uh, rational empiricism. And if one just looks at the history of these ideas, they emerged um, in Western context uh, against the Christian backdrop. And in a dialogical process uh, where both uh, modernity uh, uh, was historically shaped and Christianity in relation to modernity was reshaped. So it is meaningful to ask, uh, as many ha as scholars have asked, um, is modernity suitable to the Muslim context? Uh, is, uh, should Muslims modernize and on the same pathways that the Western modernity has occurred? This was a very uh, controversial topic given that Muslim communities often encountered modernity in form of colonialism uh, uh, and through a very violent kind of encounter uh, uh, and later on through Orientalism, the, the depiction uh, uh, and ideas that came with it. For a period of time, uh, this has emerged, uh, this has generated many kind of conversations among the Muslim uh, scholars. Some uh, believe, some have tried to Islamize modernity um, by placing the, by finding the seeds of modern ideas in pre-modern reservoir of Islam. Um, and they have tried to reconstruct, uh, sorry, deconstruct the Islamic tradition uh, from modern perspective as a way to kind of create a way for introduction of what they consider to be modernity in the Muslim context. I will give you some example. For example, Mustafa Eichel, who's uh, a public intellectual, has been uh, criticizing the Ash'arism of uh, uh, Islamic orthodoxy in the Sunni tradition uh, for um, its privileging uh, revelation over reason as a source of determining the moral uh, quality of an action, for example. Um, and he believes that if we do away with Asherism, it would lead the way for introduction of modernity in the Muslim context. There are other scholars as well. Some have argued the fiqh centrism of Islam. Um, Said Akhlaq made an argument that is very close to that, uh, arguing that Islamic tradition has focused so much on fiqh in, uh, at the cost of higher ideals of Islam. 
this is one side of conversation. The other side of conversations actually argues that modernity should be totally rejected because of its close association with colonialism, war making, and environmental destruction. There are um, uh, philosophers, Muslim philosophers like uh, Abdul Rahman Taha, who have argued that Muslims should think of multiple modernities and construct their own modernity in a critical way, dealing with the Western modernity in a critical way, and should not adopt Western modernity because of all the bad things that have come with it. Um, another famous scholar, Wa'al Halaq, um, who's a, a jurisprudence, uh, who's a historian of Islamic jurisprudence, uh, has argued that modernity is at the root cause of uh, the environmental destructions and war making and moral degradation that we see in the world. And the Muslim as uh, Islam as a kind of rival civilization and a rival uh, uh, system of thought should reject modernity um, and go back to actually to pre-modern uh, uh, ideas as a way to uh, find uh, guidance in, 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 in for, their, for their lives. Muslims should go back to pre-modern ideas. This, both groups of scholars agree that the traditional Islam is incompatible with modernity, but they have different um, ideas as to how uh, we should, what should we do about it? But in the middle, of, obviously, there are many scholars who are tra remain traditionalist, but try to do some kind of limited synthesis of uh, modern ideas with traditional methodology. Uh, one of the best example of this is one of the uh, professors who actually used to teach at the uh, University of Washington, uh, Professor Jonathan Brown. Uh, um, he, one of his works, for example, uh, on slavery in Islam. Um, tries to use, remains committed to traditional uh, uh, epistemology, but tries to argue, defend the moral authority of tradition against uh, 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 slavery, uh, abolition, abolitionist uh, kind of moral claims uh, by basically trying to argue that ORF, um, uh, the way it was understood in traditional Islam, uh, Islamic fiqh, uh, can be used to accommodate ev moral evolution that happened on the question of slavery without having to dispense with the epistemology and, and methodology of uh, uh, traditional Islam. So that's kind of the landscape. Where would Taliban come in? Like, how do they fit in that landscape? Taliban, if you read their original sources uh, from the 90s when they emerged, and the current sources, for example, the Chief Justice uh, recently re re uh, written a book, they basically state their mission very clearly, uh, if one is to take them seriously. Um, they want to create an Islamic state. And if you ask them what is an Islamic state, um, they would give you a very kind of succinct explanation of it. For example, the chief justice, the current chief justice of Taliban writes, the Islamic state will not succeed without implementations of laws of Quran and Sunnah. And he uses the word law, like the Qanun, right? Not fiqh or, or sharia, which are, um, um, as um, Hassan talked about, there could be some slippage, conceptual slippage between the two, but they see them as, uh, at least in their minds, as uh, you know, equal, in accordance with the understanding of the early generations of Muslim mujtahideen, the jurists, and this was the aim of the jihad in Afghanistan, the Taliban jihad, and um, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which is the political regime they tend to, they want to establish, right? So they basically want to reestablish Islamic tradition in, in Afghanistan through force and make sure that the laws as they were articulated in Islamic tradition are implemented. Um, and again, we can interrogate this idea of what we mean by law. Okay? So. What does that mean? Does that mean Taliban are um, kind of a rejection of modernity? They are rejecting modernity? Actually, I think the answer is a bit more complex. Um, Taliban actually are modernizers in certain areas. Um, if one, for example, they fully admit the international order that is based on um, sovereignty of nation state. They want to be part of it. They seek uh, acceptance and recognition. Um, they want to build a nation state. Um, they have used rhetoric of nationalism. Um, they want to use Afghaniyat and Islamiyat, the two kind of elements to create a unifying national uh, um, character for the country. Um, they are very much committed to the Weberian state of monopolizing violence uh, and bureaucratizing, bureaucratizing and regularizing, regularizing government functions. They've even bureaucratized some of the uh, uh, religious functions uh, of the state, like fatwa making is now reduced to a department within the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, they've established a ministry of uh, promotion of uh, uh, promotion of virtue and prevention of vice to uh, uh, implement a religious duty through a, a bureaucratized uh, public office. And they have done so. They have created these government, kind of government institutions by sometimes actually um, using pre-modernity uh, sources of Islam, like traditional uh, sources of Islam, to Islamize these new ideas. For example, this gives you one example. Mullah Omar, the group's founder, once used an Ejara-based argument. Ejara is a name for contract of hire in traditional Islamic jurisprudence to argue that Taliban uh, officials should maintain 
perfect attendance as government employees. So he was making argument that you should not come to work late and, 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 and uh, should remain on the job. You presenting an HR-based analysis. Um, so kind of tries to Islamize bureaucracy in that sense. The current chief justice of Taliban relies on al Maurudi, uh, who's a major Shafi era uh, 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 jurist, um, who has written on the political system of Abbasi uh, era. Uh, even though he's a Shafi person, uh, uh, the current Taliban Chief Justice relies on his work to Islamize the position of ministries and other administrative bodies that uh, uh, they have inherited from the Islamic Republic, which are inherently modern and don't have really uh, uh, analogous kind of uh, uh, parties in uh, par analogous kind of references in in pre-modern era. And those are what they make them modern. They are fully committed to nation state and and, and Weberian state and try to um, Islamize them the same way that the uh, people uh, like uh, liberal intellectual Muslims try to Islamize some of the modern ideas of uh, individual liberties, for example. But when it comes to issues of rights, they may represent the most true rejection of modernity. I don't need to recount the Taliban's kind of stance on individual rights. Uh, the gender policies are, 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 are uh, universally known. They have banned women from attending secondary, girls from attending secondary education. They have banned women in almost all public places. Um, they do not admit, uh, they do not accept the basic idea of universal human rights. Um, they re republicize religion. So there's no distinction in their system of governance between moral morality and criminal law between crime and a sin. They're all within the realm of the state enforcement. And I argue they do this not by being, um, and there are many people who criticize them from a traditional perspective. Um, and there are many jurists who disagree with the Taliban on their interpretation of traditional Islam. But I think um, those uh, uh, criticisms are weak because we have actually have a, a, a growing body of literature, a post kind of orientalist kind of literature coming from a feminist uh, scholars of Islamic jurisprudence fiqh, and Islamic ethics more importantly, that have they have shown that the gendered spirit of pre-Islamic fiqh and pre-Islamic ethics, um, that the idea of uh, uh, gender hierarchies, the, the limitations on, on, on women's ability to achieve moral, uh, certain moral stands, uh, certain moral status, and the idea that feminine, uh, being a uh, female is a kind of, uh, a deficiency, a legal deficiency uh, that is comparable to slavery, for example, in the work of Keisha Ali, not being a free person. So we have pretty much established, I think, a good body of work that shows that pre-modern spirit of fiqh and, uh, and ethics were very much gendered. And Taliban's approach, uh, uh, while maybe uh, um, kind of misogynistic and sexist from a modern sensibility, actually is consistent with, from a pre uh, with the pre-modern spirit of fiqh and ethos of the uh, fiqh and Islamic ethics. Um, and that kind of lies kind of the, the dilemma here, because we also have other um, bodies of work, very good work, that show that the experience of Muslims was much more complex. Uh, women, uh, uh, Muslim women in, throughout history, in the pre-modern era, uh, used fiqh and Islamic ethics to challenge uh, uh, restrictive rules in, in, in courts and other places. They have claimed political authority. Uh, um, and they often relied on, on precepts of Quran and others to make their arguments. Um, and in practice, the print was much more complex. And there were other paradoxes that uh, while we looking by, uh, at the male fuqaha production of ethics and, and ethics uh, may not give you the full picture. But they, they, here, in my opinion, lies a problem that groups like Taliban try to recreate what they consider pure Islamic society using a textual pre-modern blueprint. And as such, their imagined most ideal Muslim society cannot contain the multitude and more normative kind of paradoxes that the pre-modern Muslim societies, by virtue of being a living tradition, actually, uh, and not a textually reconstructed one, actually contained. So in a sense, um, they are just looking at one normative representation of Islamic tradition one, I think they can actually, uh, one that I actually understand very well. And they are, that is why when they try to go back to the Islamic society of the past, they may actually create a society, uh, a textually reconstructed society that may actually be even more repressive uh, than what was actually lived in the, in, in the Muslim history. Right? And I think that's one major kind of point I would like to make. The other point I would like to make is that those who try to challenge Taliban from a traditional perspective 
would also have to admit um, their criticism would be weak unless they have they concede to a source of moral evolution outside those texts. So I think they cannot remain, in my opinion, they cannot remain faithful to the basic kind of underpinning ethos of pre-modern fiqh while accommodating the kind of the, the, uh, some moral evolution that has happened in modernity. Um, it does not mean that they, the uh, modern uh, um, liberal modernity should be uncritically accepted. I, I would not propose that. But I think um, it, the idea that we can have uh, that we can have and kind of preserve the tradition, uh, uh, that especially in areas of fair and ethics, and, and remain um, and upgrade it with uh, um, some moral modern morality um, without kind of re-examining some of the basic assumptions of pre-modern uh, uh, jurisprudence would not be enough to critique the Taliban. Because Taliban, I think, actually are being not necessarily formalistic, even though they're methodologically uh, traditionalist uh, and to a certain extent. And there are many who critique them using a traditional methodology in a very effective way. But I think they are using method uh, traditional methodology in a way that male fuqaha, like for example, people like al-Shafi'i, would not agree with because uh, or Ibn Taymiyyah uh, uh, would not agree with because those focus, I think, understood the Islamic ethos of the work they were doing very much differently. And Taliban's understanding, especially on the issues of women, are consistent, I think, with the uh, pre-modern ideas. So to state it in a succinct, a succinct way, um, you have to ha reopen conversations about the moral evolution uh, that has happened outside those texts and be much more critical of Islamic tradition and fundamental uh, assumptions of it if one is to make an effective criticism of the Taliban's gender policies from a traditional perspective. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Harun. That was really fascinating. And I can see the questions are coming in. So please keep them coming. We'll have a good amount of time for discussion because our speakers have all stayed within their time. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our third and final speaker, Professor Sharif Huzuri, who holds a PhD in international relations from the Center for International Politics, Organization and Disarmament in the School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Uh, Professor Huzuri taught both undergraduate and graduate students in Afghanistan and was the vice chancellor for academic affairs in Afghanistan University before leaving the country after the Taliban takeover in August 2021. He is currently a fellow and visiting scholar at the Ainaudi Center's South Asia program at Cornell University. His research areas are Afghanistan politics and foreign policy, identity politics, South Asia and Middle Eastern politics, cultural studies, and conflict resolution and peace. Welcome, Professor Huzuri. Oh, I think you have to turn off your, you turn on your microphone, please. Um, uh, thank you, and uh, I welcome all. Um, and also, in the same time, I thanks uh, from Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies for having uh, this program uh, with us um, uh, today. <clears throat> Basically, today, uh, in order to connect my talk with uh, my colleagues uh, that already mentioned, um, you know, how to deal with this uh, pre-modern and uh, theocrat Taliban, uh, uh, how to deal with them, how to get rid of them, because we know that. Uh, the people who are there in Afghanistan, they cannot really do a lot of things, uh, but, but, but the only hope is uh, coming from diaspora. So that is why I'm trying to basically uh, speak about diaspora and how they can engage with Afghanistan uh, and Afghanistan politics, particularly right now. <clears throat> but unfortunately, when, when you look at to the Afghan diaspora structure and their activities, you will come to know that this hope that you are making, it will become, you know, in, turn into despair because I will explain to you that how and why. <clears throat> uh, 
there's no doubt that uh, the diaspora play an important role uh, in the uh, politics of the homeland. And I believe also that what's happening in the country uh, or in the homeland would, great, would have a great effect on the uh, structure of the uh, uh, diaspora, particularly in the case of Afghan diaspora. Also, we know that the politics of Afghanistan, uh, you know, <clears throat> Uh, created a kind of uh, precondition for the empires and big powers to intervene. And the outcome was uh, totally a kind of destruction and conflict and instability. And it created a kind of uh, 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 fragile state in Afghanistan. So the outcome was a migration. Uh, so the outcome of the migration was, of course, uh, forming the diaspora. So uh, that is why this kind of you know, fragile state made Afghanistan as a leading country uh, uh, for the origin of the refugees from 1979 and of course still now. Um, <clears throat> why I'm talking about diaspora, as I mentioned to you, uh, because there are a lot of uh, scholars, scholarly works you can find on, on Afghanistan, but unfortunately very less on, on Afghan diaspora. And uh, of course, the Afghan diaspora, as I mentioned to you, it, had, uh, it, it played an important role in the past we can judge that either it was destructive or, or constructive. And through end of my uh, slide, you will come to know that how was it. Uh, uh, so um, for example, as an example, I want to tell you about the Afghan diaspora. I believe that the Afghan nationalism in, in 19th century uh, or 20th century, it was produced uh, or introduced to the Afghan uh, society by the exiled Afghans or Afghan diaspora like, for example, Mahmoud Tarzi, that still we are suffering from. And uh, I believe that the civil war also, to some extent, uh, funded uh, by the Afghan diaspora in the regional countries, as well as in abroad, uh, uh, particularly in the, in the line of ethnic uh, thinking. And also, we should, we should, we should also say that the, the lot of negotiation, uh, you know, is sponsored by Afghan diaspora in the regional countries. And uh, probably you remember that the Moscow kind of you know, dialogue uh, among the Taliban and the former Taliban, uh, Afghanistan regime or Afghanistan government was also negotiated by the, by the Afghan diaspora. And also uh, the centralized system that we call democracy in post 2001, it was suggested by the Afghan diaspora in Washington uh, by the Afghan technocrats here, uh, uh, mostly from a particular ethnic groups. Uh, so we do have this kind of centralized system uh, we did have from 2001 till 2008, uh, 21. And also very much important right now, the whole campaign against the Taliban, pressurize the international community and to offer the talk that right now we are doing, it is also, you know, that the Afghan diaspora is starting to, doing, uh, uh, to do all this thing. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, in this part, uh, you know, I mean, to define the Afghan diaspora itself. So going back to the uh, uh, literature on, on diaspora itself. Um, so we all know probably that uh, for the first time, this diaspora studies came up with uh, uh, the article by William Safran in 1991. And later on, uh, uh, I just want to use from uh, the definition of Jonathan Grossman in 2019, how he defined the diaspora and out of it, I will try to define the Afghan diaspora itself. So he defines code diaspora as a transnational community uh, whose members or their ancestors immigrated or were dispersed from the original homeland, but remains oriented uh, to it and preserve a group kind of uh, uh, identity. So um, uh, also Robin Cohen, you know, do a kind of, uh, 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 put a kind of, you know, characteristic for diaspora itself, like it should be dispersed, it should have a shared identity, collective memory they do have, homeland orientation, as I mentioned already, and also affinity and solidarity among the members. Uh, uh, he is uh, uh, talking about this one. And also he has a kind of typology on, uh, Robin Cohen has a kind of typology, which I later on use from in order to uh, uh, typologize the Afghan diaspora itself. He is uh, he's, uh, saying about victim, labor, imperial, trade, deterritorialized and incipient diaspora. Using from these two, I will say that the Afghan, according to me, uh, definition for Afghan diaspora is a community in making or incipient whose members immigrated from Afghanistan through different waves and dispersed from their original homeland across the world, but remained oriented to Afghanistan and try to preserve a group identity. So uh, you can see from my definition that I use 
uh, actually I, I use from the typology of Cohen in order to say that Afghan diaspora is an incipient diaspora. It is in making, it is in an evolutionary stage. It, sometimes you cannot even call the, uh, the, the Afghan immigrants in foreign land as Afghan diaspora, uh, according to certain, uh, 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 certain features or characteristics. <clears throat> As I told you uh, in the initial uh, uh, of my speaking, that uh, Afghan diaspora was the outcome of the, of the immigration in Afghanistan. As I mentioned to you, started from 1978 onwards. But I believe that it was, there were certain indicators, indicators for this immigration from Afghanistan. It was democratic, demographic pressure, it was economic pressure, and also political suppression in Afghanistan. But I believe that all these three, a combination of three, uh, played an important role on immigration of Afghans. So it is started from 1978, but I believe that it happened much more before, because in 1980, uh, when Abdurrahman Khan started to suppress the minorities in the country, so the first uh, big, uh, you know, uh, migration is started by Hazara community in Afghanistan, started to scatter in the regional countries and the countries in the region, particularly Pakistan and. Iran, but later on it started basically more from 1987 onward when the Soviet Union, when the communists took the power, Soviet Union intervened in the country, and later on the uh, civil war is started by the Mujahideen among themselves, but in the third stage uh, uh, migration wave it was uh, in 1998 when the Taliban uh, first ruling you know, got established, and also the fourth uh, uh, wave was um, the US invasion and also a kind of US occupation in the country. And the, and, and the first one, the current wave is also there that uh, started from 2021, I guess, when the um, uh, Islamic uh, Republic got, got collapsed. And right now we can see that a wave of migration is, is going on that probably it, um, after 20 years or 30 years, they will also add to this Afghan diaspora. <clears throat> Having said about all this thing, I must say that in order to uh, examine the Afghan diaspora here, I will focus on three aspects uh, or three features uh, in order to find out that Afghan diaspora is really a kind of united diaspora, or can we call them as a diaspora? Do they believe in imagined community as a nation or uh, they're coming from the same country, from the same nationality or all? Uh, I will focus on family, on the known community and imagined community. <clears throat> What does it mean? Afghan diaspora among themselves here, um, uh, as well as their orientation toward the homeland, they are very much committed to their, toward their families, toward their relatives. They do have a very good engagement with them. They, they, they are have a very good commitment toward them. And also, you know, they are, they are sending uh, some monies uh, to, to their, their, their families or relatives back to Afghanistan. Uh, but, but also they are very much united in the known community, or I call it toward the ethnic groups. Uh, uh, they are very much connected to each other here in the foreign land as a diaspora, as well as toward their communities or ethnic groups in the country. But unfortunately, as uh, Carolyn Fisher in 2015, uh, she wrote an article about the Afghan diaspora in, in Germany, as well as the UK, she came to know to this conclusion that there is no imagined community among the Afghan. They do not believe uh, as an Afghan, as a nation, you know. Uh, so there is, they, they, they are very much fractured in that case. So that is why I can say that the Afghan diaspora is very, very much committed toward the family and the known community, which is the ethnic group I call, but unfortunately very less to that imagined community as a nation. Uh, like, like there are a lot of communities here uh, diaspora communities from other countries, they are very much, you know, do believe in that, that kind of nationhood or nation or something, but um, uh, Afghans know. I will just quote from the uh, Fisher ar uh, argument. Uh, they're saying that, he says that taking, although people or Afghan diaspora may take action in the name of an imagined Afghan community or an imaginary Afghanistan, this imagined community does not provide a basis for social mobilization. Thus, Afghans do not act as a cohesive, uh, you know, as a united diaspora itself. But I do believe that in a foreign land or in the host land, uh, legally and socially, uh, the Afghan diaspora is going to be considered an Afghan diaspora. Uh, but in reality, uh, they are very much fragmented and considered uh, uh, as, as a diaspora in evolving or in, in an in incipient kind of diaspora. <clears throat> um, 
Um, having said about that one, as I mentioned to you, uh, I just want to add this two uh, uh, word. That is, Afghan diaspora is very much uh, influenced uh, by the out there rather than uh, in here or, 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 or here, you know. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, you know, Afghan diaspora is very much influenced by, uh, by the society out there in Afghanistan rather than here in the host land. Uh, so how come, uh, and, and this one also, you know, a kind of created a fraction among the, the, the uh, diaspora, Afghan diaspora here. For example, in Afghanistan, uh, when the Afghan nationalists got, you know, uh, it, uh, 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 initiated in 21st century, someone is the owner of the country and some others are the Mahajir or the immigrants. Uh, so uh, uh, in the time of, you know, there was a Mujahid communist kind of faction in Afghanistan. Later on, it was influenced here among the diaspora. They keep calling each other as a Mujahid, someone called it, another one as a communist. And later on, we did have a kind of Taliban, uh, you know, uh, supporters and then resistors or Muqawmati. They, they did have such a kind of thing. And also right now, we do have a kind of this dichotomy called patriot versus traitor. They're calling each other in that way from the time when the uh, uh, Islamic Republic was collapsed. So this is the thing, you know, that the Afghan diaspora, unfortunately, is gonna be influenced by all sort of thing, uh, but they do not learn from the host land values, uh, which is very much important that we have to think. Uh, for example, in the host land, uh, they have to believe in humanity. They have to uh, think in multiculturalism. They have to learn from this whole society rather than from what's going on in the country or the problems going on there. They have to believe in equality, in injustice, uh, injustice and uh, in, in coexistence. Uh, and, and according to that, they can do a lot of things. You know, the diaspora, of course, we all of know uh, that uh, they can do an ethnic lobby in the host land. They can uh, do a kind of campaign to democratize the authoritarian regime in the homeland that right now we have to do uh, since the Taliban is ruling in Afghanistan. And also they can, you know, mediate between uh, 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 the, the home and host societies to promote a kind of transnational ties and transmit values of pluralism and democracy in their homeland. Uh, and, and, and through that, they can influence the foreign policy of the host land uh, that, that right now, you know, uh, that uh, many Afghans trying to do, for example, the foreign policy of the US toward the Taliban. And they want to, you know, keep showing that the brutalities of the Taliban regime in the country, particularly uh, violating uh, the human rights and women rights, uh, uh, you know, th th they can do all sort of thing. But uh, unfortunately for Afghans, you know, as I mentioned to you, they are very much thinking in a sub-national level. Uh, when they're doing a lobby, they are thinking about the ethnic groups and all sort of thing. Uh, so th that is, you know, the problems that uh, 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 we do have among the Afghan diaspora. And also it jeopardizing the uh, the, the position of the diaspora in order to pressurize the, uh, the, the, the regime in the country and to influence the foreign policy of the uh, countries in abroad. For example, as I tell you, I, I can tell you, for example, uh, three examples I can make uh, that in 1990s, we did have a civil war in Afghanistan, but uh, the diaspora in the foreign land, particularly in the US, they were thinking about that ethnic kind of line. For example, Anwar al Hadi, who was a very famous scholar, and who was living in the US. In that time of 1990s, he came up with the, an article called The Decline of Pashtun. He was thinking in that way, not thinking about what's going in Afghanistan, how we can uh, uh, you know, survive this country. And later on, for example, in, 19, in 2001, as I mentioned to you, the, the, the technocrats in here in the US, uh, Ashraf Ghani was part of that, Zalmai Khalzad was also there, Ahmad Jalali, and all sort of people. So they, they you know, suggested a kind of centralized system for Afghanistan, which everyone knows it doesn't work because it didn't work in the past. So uh, they were thinking that if we do have such a kind of things that can you know, safeguard the interest of a particular group or a particular ethnic group, unfortunately. So these kind of things is which is going on among the diaspora. And uh, as I mentioned to you, it, it, it will weaken their position in order to uh, uh, play a much more important role or powerful role. And uh, uh, since the time I have to uh, uh, get stick with the time, so I will stop here and probably in the time of q and I, uh, I can discuss further the issues which I discussed to you right now. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for our audience for your wonderful attention and participation. At this point, I'm going to ask all of our colleagues uh, to come back on, um, Professor Rahimi, Professor Akhlaq, and Professor Huzuri. And um, let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you said. Um, we have some questions that have come in that engage all three of your, your uh, discussions, your papers. But um, what I'm, I'm gonna talk about some of the, the trends that I see here in the Q&A. And one thing that I see is a lot of questions about what we mean by law or qanun, as you said, uh, Harun, versus faq or sharia. And I was wondering if some of you would like to further elaborate on this because we do have a number of questions about the different attributes of those. And um, I think, um, you know, just for my own, from my own work in Iran, I, I do think that codification of the shar has its own meaning making. And I think, Harun, you touched on that when you spoke about law. And I wonder if we can address a little bit the power of codification that is often unnoticed and undiscussed in Western so-called liberal societies. And, and I'll start with that question, and then I'll continue um, with some of the other questions we have. But I'll give you a, a chance to take a stab at those. And Professor Huzuri, please come back. <laughs> Professor Akhlaq would like to go first. Um, since I think you touched this idea of the distinction between law and fair and how it was reduced. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can uh, yeah, well, uh, say okay. something. So uh, actually, uh, my presentation was about the rule of law. So it included all four main types of the law. So the not just the, the jurisprudence, but the other laws that are constitution, uh, uh, a statute, the regulation, the common law. So when I'm saying the rule of law is weak in Muslim country, so they are always trying to get around of this law. So uh, and we, I, I'm pretty sure everybody who has experience there, so they can uh, remember many examples that people want to get rid of the rule of law. So yeah, all all kind of law are uh, important for me. Uh, but uh, if we see there is a less uh, attempt to get rid of the uh, Sharia law because they are th th that's a kind of the holy law and they, uh, they, uh, there is a, some uh, yeah, punishment or reward associated with that. So that's a little less. But as I just talked, uh, in modern time, Sharia has no that kind of the uh, uh the, the law that it has before that that was the only law before the uh, uh, modern uh state nation state so it's a light no it's a light and it is not the same thing so people are just looking for something to get uh, rid of that yeah that's what i mean by law so they are a lot more to talk to distinguish between law and sharia but uh, just one more point uh, in majority of uh, uh, Muslim countries, so even we have two institutions, one like a madrasa for Sharia law or consul of Ifta, it's a different name in different countries. One is the uh, law that is introduced by the state, but because this Muslim country, always there is a kind of the uh, uh, agreement or kind of the support each other to deal with each other. So the uh, they, they in a particular issue they they disagree, but in the major issue they agree, and that's a one thing I think to uh, can help us to go to the discussion of the codification of the law that uh, uh, Professor Arzu just mentioned that uh, it it has start with different approach in Muslim country like country like Pakistan they start just uh, uh, looking for conformity between uh, the uh, law that they had from the colonizer with the Sharia law. An interesting point is that when they went to that direction, uh, for five years, they uh, there was a council responsible to uh, to check 
whole law, uh, I think it was in early 1950s, Council of the Islamic Ideology. For five years, they shake all law they had in the Pakistan uh, inherited from the uh, UK, and they found just 10% uh, of this law that has in some way uh, the contradictory to the Sharia, and they uh, uh, introduced some uh, solution to that. But in, in Egypt, in Turkey, in, in particular in Syria, they went to different way that maybe uh, Rahimi, Professor Rahimi wants to talk more about that. No, I mean, and Taliban have formed their own committee now that is supposedly reviewing all the laws from the Islamic Republic, International Islamic Republic, to confirm whether they comply with the uh, precepts of Sharia or not. But I think the point that Dr. Um, Arzu made is, is very, very, I think, interesting. And as you said, underappreciated, this process of codification. Um, because I think the uh, if you go look at the history, uh, one of the early attempts, for example, was the Ottoman empires, they tried to compile the uh, the preferred opinions of Hanafi jurisprudence in uh, Majalla that uh, um, Mr. Khlaoui also refers to. In a sense, the, the claim was not that we're going to change the substantive law. The claim was that we're going to change the way you access the law. And we uh, or our preferred ulama would be the arbiter of how we can reduce this kind of plurality, this this body of discourse, the text that is product of a body of discourse into a law-like kind of a statement of code. And those law-like statements of code uh, were coming from, were used from the European model, right? They were basically trying to uh, fit the Islamic jurisprudence into the Western concept of law as a way to um, strengthen the state. I mean, Ottoman Empire was in competition with the European powers, wanted to strengthen its power. And it's not, um, Ottomans are not the first one to do it. Um, in India, uh, the Mughal Empire tried to create the uh, Fatawi of Dehlavi with the same purpose, that I want to uh, extend my power across the Indian uh, continent. Uh, I will compile a, a group of scholars whose job would be to uh, uh, compile the preferred opinions in a code-like text where we can distribute them. It is interesting that Taliban, coming back to the case of Taliban, have used both. They have used Majalla. They, technically, Majalla is the... Uh, one major source that Taliban have remained committed to when it comes to resolution of disputes before courts. And also the Fatawi uh, al Mullah Omar himself, the group's founder, once cited Fatawi uh, al as a, a basis of authority uh, for, claiming, uh, for claiming authority for himself as a ruler. But the point is that none of these were meant to be law in a sense uh, that they were not meant to be defining and limiting the power of the ruler. Um, they were actually tools meant to is strengthening the power of ruler against the competing kind of autonomous class of ulama. So they were trying to strengthen the state by transforming the way the Islamic jurisprudence uh, um, would relate to public authority. I think that gets to what Mr. Akhlaqi is talking about, the rule of law. It was not meant to be uh, uh, law in a sense that it would be a way to constrain the power of the state. Majalla was not supposed to um, restrain the power of Ottoman Empire. It was mostly private law to begin with. But Abiyo was not uh, was did not have the same function either. And I think in Iran, um, we talk about. I mean, Iran also inherited a, a body of Western laws influenced by France and other places, and they also went through periods of uh, Islamization under the, the Islamic Republic, and they had this give and take idea of okay, we can produce code like fiqh based um, kind of text, but what would that do to the authority of the state and the authority of ulama? In my experience, it ends up privileging a group of ulama who have a, a whole political power and does not lead to kind of a rule of law in that sense. But it is transformative in terms of epistemology of how we uh, understand it. And I think that's the point uh, while Halak makes in his impossible state that you really, you're kind of a sleight of hand here. You're training like traditional concepts of fiqh into state law. And in the process, you are not, you cannot have remain, maintain the integrity of those pre-modern ideas. It was a little bit of a ramble, but yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Professor Huzuri, would you like to speak to that question or is that not something that is you want to discuss? I think uh, since it doesn't have, you know, quite have a connection with my talk, so I better to just leave to whatever Harun and Hassan say about. Okay. Well, we do have a number of questions about law, 
Um, but I do want to bring you into the conversation and I want to um, maybe have a question about when you're speaking with regards to the diaspora and the different kinds of diaspora, um, as we know, there's Afghan diaspora, not just regionally spread out in uh, North America and Europe, but also in Iran, in Pakistan. And I was just wondering, can we speak of a diaspora and Afghan diaspora? And how does the sort of multiplicity of places where the diasporas reside influence um, how, that, as you were saying, the idea of a greater nation? Um, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I will just go to the um, article which is written by uh, Roger Brubaker, and uh, he actually wrote an article called Diaspora of Diasporas. Uh, yeah, I mean, that diaspora itself, is, you know, uh, is so much dispersed, I mean, has been used as a kind of disciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary kind of subjects right now, you can, you can use this diaspora for age and everything. You know, so that is why right now uh, he was saying that if you use this diaspora into a very different kind of fields and subjects, then you will lose the touch with the diaspora itself. Um, uh, and having said about that one, uh, basically there is a particular, uh, uh, you know, kind of feature for the diaspora in order to uh, call someone or some community as diaspora. Uh, because they have, to, they have to remain in a country for, for some time. And then one more important thing is that they have to form, uh, be able to form a kind of community, make a kind of organization, and they have to deal you know, with, the, with the society they are living. You mentioned about the Western and the regional countries, countries in the region, particularly Pakistan and Iran, it, the, the, the activities of diaspora uh, is very much dependent on the internal politics or a code of law that you have mentioned already of the host land. If they are very much, you know, uh, friendly toward the immigrants and allow them later on to, you know, get a citizenship, get, you know, uh, involved with the society, uh, and then later on, you know, become a citizens of that country. So they can, you know, they can later on form an organization, do accordingly, you know, so they would be much more, uh, they would have much more freedom to act. But unfortunately, in case of Iran, in case of there are a lot of uh, Afghans who are living in, in, in Arab, Arab countries and the Gulf, uh, Persian Gulf countries. So they don't have any kind of right, you know, they cannot do any kind of politics. They cannot do any kind of, you know, uh, social uh, movements or, you know, uh, you know uh, or, or this kind of advocacy for rights. So we cannot call them, unfortunately, as a kind of, you know, uh, diaspora, because another feature for diaspora is this, that they have to stay with the land and they should not come and go, you know, but in a, in a, in a country, in the region, they keep coming and going. And so that they, they cannot make that kind of community, which it has to be. So whatever I say in my, you know, in my argument, I, I'm mostly focusing, even my examples were there from, from the countries at the host land, which is very much friendly, and welcoming, particularly Western and you know uh, 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 and the uh, and the North America, but uh, I came across with the article uh, which was did a research on Afghan diaspora in Canada, in the U.S., in in Europe, but in in Turkey even. But uh, there, there are some articles about Pakistan uh, and and also Iran, but the the picture is very you know you know dark. You know we cannot they they they, they don't call themselves as a uh, they call the Afghan uh, immigrants, they call them as an Afghan immigrant rather than calling as, as, as an Afghan diaspora. Thank you so much. Um, I know Professor Akhlaq needs to leave a little bit early, so I do want to get one more question in about law. Um, and we have a few questions, I'm just going to kind of take them together. Um, where are People, the uh, people asking them are are kind of wondering about the treatment of women and ethnic and religious minorities at the hands of the Taliban in the name of Islam. And what what are uh, the people who are asking the questions are saying is that you know it seems that one person is saying 
Islam is being used as a tool of state power. And the other is saying, how does this harsh treatment of minorities and women square with the eth ethical um, guidelines of Islam? So, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, actually, uh, you're right. So uh, this uh, perspective, the uh, both have their own justification or their uh, um, uh, their reason to, to believe them. But uh, personally, uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, Taliban doesn't represent even uh, the classic uh, traditional. Madras and jurisprudence. There are a lot of controversial topics there. So uh, yeah, I, I'm not saying that there is not discrimination in that. For sure, with the modern idea, we can find a lot of discrimination in classical jurisprudence with regard to women, with regard to many things. But, uh, but Taliban, uh, they just use the guise, the mask of the uh, classic jurisprudence to uh, to promote their ideology. So they consider themselves Hanafi, and we know Hanafi is the uh, school of law in Islam that uh, long, long uh, time ago, uh, centuries ago, uh, allowed women or even promoted women to act like a just. And Taliban doesn't allow women to go to the at the uh, a school to learn something. So there is no connection between Taliban and Hanafi school. So, and there are many, many other things. Uh, to give you one more example, so the mindset of Taliban and many of this Islamic group is not like uh, jurisprudence, particularly Hanafi. So I, I just tell you one example, uh, particularly for the people who would like to study more so we have the concept of the istihsan, sometimes it's saying Hanafi jurisprudence is the jurisprudence of the ishtihad and istihsan. What does mean istihsan? Istihsan means that, in a simple language, it means that if you are sure this is the law of God, this is divine law, but it doesn't make sense to people, it doesn't uh, deliver justice to society, just forget that law. So if you are sure this is law of God, forget that if it doesn't provide justice. Uh, in the, the rival schools of jurisprudence to Hanafi, mostly they uh, promoted Saddo Zaraye saying uh, something that Islam's group nowadays saying, be careful that something may be changed the mindset of Muslim and blocking. And they have to, they saying to block the means that mislead Muslim and Hanafi jurisprudence, they didn't pay attention to Sadda Zarai. They were very liberal with regard to classical and pre-modern time. So, and Taliban doesn't. So it means that uh, first, uh, the, this kind of group does not represent uh, uh, classical jurisprudence. Uh, the second point is that, yes, there are some discrimination in this uh, classical uh, jurisprudence with regard to the male interpretation of the law in history of Islam and in history of the religion and history of the many, many religion and culture. So I think uh, I, I personally promote uh, or uh, advocate for Muslim feminists that use some Islamic uh, idea to, uh, to promote women's rights in Islam. And as you said, uh, one of my, uh, I see uh, one a question about the suggestion, one thing that you also uh, talk about that, to change Islam from a kind of the religion focus with the law to religion focus on spirituality, on ethics. So that's, I think, the way that can help us to get rid of this kind of situation. And if I may add, I mean, when we talk about law, we were already making a conceptual kind of switch. Uh, the pre-modern uh, text would not think of law in the same way. Um, law is associated with nation states, and I mean, fundamentally, it's the command of uncommanded commander, which emerged in the Western context through a process of demystification uh, uh, that, that, that happened there. So we are all talking about a conceptual kind of conceptually different thing than uh, pre-classic, uh, pre-modern classical jurisprudence. 
But it does not mean that the pre-modern classical jurisprudence did not have uh, did not contain opinions about public about matters that have to be enforced with public authority, um, which is an overlap with law, but they understood them very, very differently. With regard to whether Taliban um, represent or do not represent, I think that's a question that is impossible to answer because it's impossible to characterize pre-Islamic jurisprudence in an exhaustive manner. Um, it is, uh, it, as I said, it was a living tradition, had a lot of uh, 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 normative um, product, uh, paradoxes within it, which any living, thriving uh, uh, jurisprudence kind of discourse would have. Uh, um, Shahab Ahmad, the late Shahab Ahmad, uh, uh, I think wrote a great book, The Importance of uh, 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 Things Being Islamic, where he tried to make sense of how all these things that are seemingly contradictory would make sense within one co kind of cohesive system. Um, but I would like to say, I mean, that, that that's the important part when it comes to how you can uh, promote woman, uh, cause of women rights in Afghanistan. What they're talking about doing is not unprecedented. And they are, I think that is what I'm trying to uh, point out. For example, uh, um, Mr. Aflaq is absolutely right that uh, if you take the conclusions from Islamic jurisprudence, many times Taliban go beyond that. Right? They are much more restrictive than uh, classical jurisprudence. But they do so using a concept uh, which is called uh, fasad al-zaman, which is corruption of time, which they're not inventing this uh, out of nowhere. I mean, there is a precedent, a pedigree of Hanafi scholars and non-Hanafi scholars. Uh, basically restricting uh, certain conclusions in modern time compared to pre-modern time by arguing that uh, there, there is a stronger case to be made that those liberal kind of views, quote unquote, those permissivities that existed in pre-modern uh, uh, times should not be tolerated in modern times because we are trying to work against a morally corrupt society or a society that is morally corrupt. Uh, on uh, issues of a woman being allowed to be a judge, women being allowed to go outside, women be allowed to open, uh, not cover their face. I mean, Hanafi Madhab does not require, uh, does not consider aura the face, the face covering is not required. However, Taliban do maintain that it's required, and they're not the first to maintain that. There are there's a Hanafi, there's a pedigree in the Hanafi jurisprudence that, that uh, suggests that, um, and that actually connects to a broader trend uh, uh, that many feminist scholars, because we mentioned, uh, also identify. In his her recent work, Wives and Work, uh, uh, Marion Holmes Katz wrote about how initially the idea was that women do not have an obligation to do housework. Um, it was the uh, one of the first books of uh, Fiqh written by Imam Malik actually maintains that position strongly. And then he kind of traces that history of how ideas on this evolve when you get to Ibn Taymiyyah, he basically comes out and said, no, that is absolutely not true. Women have an obligation to do housework and they don't, uh, they cannot claim any uh, compensation for it. And it's not a mere ethical recommendation. It is part of the morally charged legal system of Islam. So you can see how morality and the spirit and ethos that emerged over time is used to sometimes override more permissive, like earlier opinions within a, the Islamic world, even pr prior to modernity. And I think Taliban can be understood as a continuation of that rather than just an anomaly that happened uh, out of nowhere. Wonderful, fascinating. This, this conversation is picking up and the questions are coming in. Um, one question I think is really interesting and worth um, some discussion is the one about the similarities between the Taliban and the ex-Republic government in terms of their disregard for the rule of law. So uh, the, the person who's asking the question is really trying to get at the um, degrees of when the state power disregards the rule of law, whether it's the Taliban or the previous government, which was a republic. So can you speak to that? Do you feel that you can speak to that at all? Either one of you? Professor Akhlaq had to leave us for another commitment. I just, uh, uh, I just want, uh, uh, regarding the previous uh, you know, discussion, I just wanted to say is sometimes I'm wondering uh, if this banning the law, banning the education for women uh, uh, do not allow them to go for a, for for a school and work and all sort of thing, and if it's not gonna be justified by the religion uh, or by Islam or the Hanafi jurisprudence that Harun and uh, and uh, uh, Hassan also mentioned, mm -hmm. then 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 what is there? I mean that from where they're getting their sources? Uh, this is a big question. And other day I, you know, Harun was also present that uh, in 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 Denver I mentioned about. The role of culture on religion, uh, uh, and sometimes people are saying that 
okay, religion is part of the culture itself. Uh, and sometimes vice versa, people are saying that culture is part of the religion because you, what, you can see the world of Islam that, um, you know, uh, Islam has been applied differently according to the context. Right now, you can see that in Indonesia, uh, in, in Indonesia, you can see that people are having their own, you know, tribal name rather than Muhammad Ali and something like, you know, Arabic names. Like, for example, the current president, that, that is Jodo Wododo, which, which doesn't have any connection with, with Arabic uh, Islam. So that is why, uh, in case of Afghanistan also, uh, I think uh, the, the people, the Taliban, the majority coming from a particular uh, ethnic groups, they do have a particular, you know, uh, uh, kind of, you know, culture, cultural values, uh, which, which coming from the rural areas. So... I think we have to think about that one also and talk about that one because we remember that in a, in a southern part of Afghanistan or in the eastern part of Afghanistan, the moment the Taliban came, all the schools shut. But I can tell you till later on for three or five months, if I remember, if I'm not wrong, Harun can correct me, that in Balkh, in other parts, in northern of Afghanistan, there were the girls' school were, were open for three to four months uh, which, which of course has a different kind of, you know, uh, rural cultural values rather than the, the South and all. Uh, so I think we have to, you know, consider that one also uh, in, 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 in our mind that uh, yes, probably culture is something, if, if uh, I, I'm pretty much sure that if, if argue in that way it would be much more Orientalist kind of argument, but I'm coming from that country and, uh, uh, and and uh, and I saw by my own eyes uh, that it happened in the villages, in the rural areas. And one of the ministers, as I, as, as I quoted in, in Denver conference, one of the ministers of the Taliban, minister of education, he said that, okay, Islam doesn't, Islam allows each and everything for the woman, but go and ask from a guy who is there in Oregon or in the rural areas, what he says about the, the, the woman education. I think I think we have to we have to think about that one also, and it will help us to uh, think. So I will have my own kind of you know opinion on the second question, but uh, I will uh, you know ask Karen to answer to the question that you raised. I want to be mindful of time, but um, I mean there are different ways you can answer a question. Uh, obviously, sociologically, there are studies that can be done, and uh, but you also can, can look at intellectual history, how ideas have changed, how people make use of ideas. Um, I, I don't think intellectual history can explain why someone picks an opinion versus other opinions, how the kind of the conclusion someone comes committed to. What I try to do is show basically the, the pedigree behind the intellectual history of these ideas that you can see with the Taliban. I cannot explain why they, I mean, they could have been com completely consistent with the methodology for them to allow women to go to school. And they obviously had certain belief that compelled them to reach that conclusion, but the uh, intellectual tools that they've used to make that argument has a history. And that, that's what I'm trying to point out. For example, Taliban do not claim that uh, uh, not a secular education, uh, worldly education is prohibited. They say it's permissible, it's mobile. But uh, whatever is mubah can be restricted by a ruler if it leads to corruption, right? Um, so we are trying to stop the means of something that would lead to corruption. And unless we are sure that uh, we can provide education in a way that would mm, remove the chance of any form of moral corruption occurring as a result of it, uh, women should remain home, right? Um, it is not an idea that would be, um, uh, that is out of history, without a history, that these ideas have histories and the way they argue them also has traction with some methodological discourse. But why they kind of arrived at that conclusion? Because I mean, as lawyers, uh, uh, so we're also a lawyer, we talk about legal indeterminacy. Like if I give you a complete description of the law methodology, it doesn't produce a result. I mean, the result is produced in a different way. Sociology, all cultural factors come into play. And laws are inherently indeterminate. Um, there are other factors that determine an outcome. But you can still talk about the met legal methodology the same way we do and, and uh, the tools that lawyers use to make arguments. Thank you so much. I, I think I just saw an, one more question come in. Let me see. Uh, yes. Oh, no, it wasn't a question, but Dana Vygrodsky just wanted to thank everyone. And it was great to see her former student, Professor Rahimi. Um, 
I just want to invite our speakers. Is, is there anything that you would like to add? Um, because not everyone can see the questions, but you can see the questions. Is there anything that you would like to add that we haven't had a chance to say before we close for the evening? There was one question about the Taliban being Hanafi and, and I think that's an in, in important question. And, um, and methodologically speaking, they are often credited to be uh, from Dioband. Um, and it gets to what we were talking about earlier, that someone may be committed to a conclusion and they can actually make arguments for that conclusion um, without you being able to explain why they made those arguments. You can explain how they made the argument, but not why. For example, Mufti um, Osmani, who's the highest authority, I mean, one of the highest figures in the uh, Diubendi uh, Madrasa circle in uh, Pakistan, came out and wrote an open letter to the Taliban's chief justice arguing that uh, banning girls from going to school is not something that is required in Sharia. But apparently, the, the Taliban supreme leader was not moved by that by that letter, having his own understanding of what he where he wanted Afghan society to go. But when the issues of Al Maurudi, which is as I said, the scholar who wrote on Islamic governance in the uh, Abbasi era, Taliban, I think, are very much and that gets to their part of being modernists. They want to create a state, and they mean seriously, they want to create an effective state. And they are very much uh, more flexible when it comes to using pre-modern sources to justify their vision of Islamic state. And they're not, they don't remain committed to Hanafi madhab only. Uh, al maurudi is, um, as you pointed out, Shafi. Um, uh, he, his work has been used extensively by the Taliban. Uh, um, and it's not, Taliban are not the first to do this in Afghanistan either. Um, the Taliban have a ministry of vice and virtue. Historically, there, um, uh, there was a, um, Muhtasab, the position of Muhtasab, which is more a place in Afghanistan in the 19th century. Amir Abdul Rahman Khan, the person who's often credited with establishing the nation state, the, the modern state, the starting the modern process of modern, modernization in Afghanistan is credited with. He was the first to codify, we talked about codification too, some rules about Muhtasabin. And the person he, um, the work that he produced draws heavily on Al Ghazali's Ahiyal Ulum. We, again, Al Ghazali is a Shafi scholar. So you can see when these groups try to use pre-modern resources or Islamic resources to fashion a state or basically Islamize uh, 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 their vision of the state, um, they don't they don't necessarily remain committed to uh, uh, madhab boundaries the same way. Partly because Islamic governance as a genre of writing in pre-modern era is a very limited genre, and there are very few scholars uh, who have written on this extensively, like Ibn Taymiyyah al Maurudi, and not every jurist would write on this. And I've written a piece on this somewhere else, and it was actually a feature of pre-modern fiqh, which was much more antagonistic on the question of public uh, uh, political leadership. Because of the early civil war that happened in Islam, political uh, jurists tend not to pass judgment as to who should be the ruler and how they should govern. They were talking about the basic uh, rules of Sharia, but they would not write political theses. Uh, it had to do with the political climate and also the civil war that ha happened early on in Islam. So the Taliban choices are limited. There are not that many scholars you can draw on to uh, make Islamic governance explicit arguments. I'll stop. I do have a, 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 a comment, an opinion, but I'm afraid of the time right now we are in... in, in... Okay, it's fine. Uh, I think in the case of, uh, in order to answer the question because of applying the rule of law and there is some similarities between the previous regime and the current regime, I think we have to go and discuss it in a broad range. I mean, that look at to the, uh, as I mentioned, your fragile state in my things, just why the Afghan government was, or a state was all the time fragile, uh, because you could see that there was all the time, you know, uh, like like uh, uh, collapsing of the state and the next state with new kind of regime and all sort of thing. Because it seems that the people of Afghanistan really don't want that kind of restriction to be imposed on their life, particularly in the rural areas. Uh, so the moment they see something very strict, uh, going to change their life, uh, so they will stand against them, particularly very much important in the time of communist regime when they started with the numbers, you know, decrees number one, number two, number six. So the people started, you know, started the, with the uh, wage war, you know, they just collapsed the regime. Um, and sometimes people are, keep saying that Ashraf Ghani was, you know, government was collapsed because he was much more, you know, strict in all sort of thing, you know, uh, he was very much disciplined guy and all sort of thing. Uh, we, we can discuss in that way. But another thing which is, I can mention is that, all the regimes, if you go and see that they're very much focused on the cities uh, and they completely forgotten the rural areas. But you can see that uh, when they wanted to apply the rule of law, they started to apply a, 
rule of law very much strict on the cities, but completely forgotten the rural areas. But if you go the history of Afghanistan, all these uh, movements, you know, uh, well, um, armed resistance, it came up from the rural areas to challenge this kind of rule of law. So that I think the Taliban is doing the same mistake right now. Uh, and I'm pretty much sure in the future also, you know, people from the rural areas will stand and you would see that uh, uh, kind of changes. And they're very much, you know, very much focused on the cities right now. I can tell you right now, the woman in the case of hijab and everything, they are very much open. There are a lot of freedom for them in the rural areas, like the place which I'm coming from. There are no kind of, you know, applying such a kind of rule of law. The girls, they do have YouTube, they do have the common fashions, uh, and they, they, they're recording the video and putting on YouTube and no one is going and bothering them. But such a kind of thing cannot happen in Kabul, in, in, in Kandahar, in, in, in Mazar Sharif or in Herat, because that is the city part that they want to you know, uh, do all sort of things. Uh, that was my very, you know, uh, very brief kind of comment on it. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Uh, I just, on my part, I just want to say that thank you, everyone, for staying with us, and thanks from from you, Arzu, for your mediator and mediation. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. And I really love <clears throat> your comment. We often have very different ideas about what's going on in the rural communities, and it is a very important um, arena for for innovation that people often forget about. They, they're fo focused so much on the cities. Um, well, this concludes our very interesting um, event. Of course, I want to thank our speakers, Professors Sayed Hassan Akhlaq, Harun Rahimi, and Sharif Huzuri. Um, we also want to thank our co-organizer, the Mesa Global Academy, and our sponsor, the Jackson School for International Studies. We have a number of co-sponsors I'd like to include in my thanks. The um, South Asia Center that has done so much of the work, of the, the back-end work, if you will. The Middle East Center, which is my center. The Global Studies Center and the UW Human Rights Center that are, who are all uh, co-sponsors. In addition, a couple of people who we have to thank are, of course, um, as I mentioned, Nick Gottschall, the man managing director of South Asia Center and Monique Thorman, the director of communications, but we cannot forget for, uh, what is that saying? Yeah. Last, but certainly not least, Jamie Ols who I forgot to mention before, who has been a tremendous help with this event, also associated with the South Asia Center. So um, we hope to be able to do more collaborations like this. Final, final point, Professor Rahimi's blog is at Harvard Law School's uh, Islamic Law blog. Is that right? Correct, yeah, Islamic Law blog, Islamic Law program at Harvard. Um, if you just Google, I think it's from Nicole. Thanks everyone and have a good night. Thank you, Dr.